been that I've been going through with you and that is how we grow how we grow and as we consider that uh, this morning we'll come to a, a sort of a natural end of part of this this won't be the end of the series but we'll come to the end of our as we've been looking at how the Word of God helps us to grow and but and there will be a bridge into what comes up next which is prayer and I know when I say prayer is going to be the, what comes up next, everybody just sort of wilts a little bit. Um, I was, I'll, I'll mention it again the next time we come to it, but I was reading uh, from uh, uh, Oswald, Sand, uh, Oswald Sanders, who was the uh, J. Oswald Sa Chambers. Wait, 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 wait. Let me check my notes. Hang on. I was up late last night. That's right. Thank you. He's got my notes. Uh, <laughs> Andreas knows what's I'm, what I'm going to say before I say it. He was the founder of uh, China Inland Mission and, and other things, wrote I think more than 40 books and he said, he said, if you want to humble a man or a woman, ask him about his prayer life. True, yes? We all kind of go, oh, when we hear. But I want to encourage you as we look ahead, I believe the Lord has given me some help for us to look at prayer not in a way that condemns us because we don't pray enough, but a way that encourages us as we look at the power and the possibility and the privilege of prayer in relationship with God. And I've been encouraged. That will be coming up later, but that's the, that's the preview. You know, when you go to a movie, you get the preview before the, before the main movie starts. That's the preview. Okay, so that's coming up. But now we look this morning, we continue with how we grow. And uh, we've been beginning with the, the, the verse that Peter has written about uh, desire the sincere milk of the word so that you may grow. But this morning I want us to begin with the words of Paul who wrote much more of the New Testament. And Paul writes to the church that is the most mature church of all of the New Testament churches, okay? More mature than the church at Jerusalem. The church at Jerusalem was the oldest church, the most well-established church, but it wasn't necessarily considered really the most mature church. The most mature church was the church of Ephesus. It's the church where there's the greatest love, the most teaching, the most mature church, the most truly spiritual church. Although the church at Corinth had a lot of spiritual gifts, Paul says, you're really immature. You're really a bunch of baby Christians because of how you're acting. Not, not because of the gifts you have you're displaying, but because of how you're acting. It was the church at Ephesus. So Paul writes to the Ephesian church, keep that in mind, this is the most mature church, so this speaks to us as well, from Ephesians 4, 11 through 15. And I've combined several translations to make it a little bit easier for us this morning. That's a little bit small for you, right? Yes. Can you see it? With your glasses. We'll pray for your eyes. I, I, I meant to make it larger. I don't know if you can make it larger quickly, Andreas, if you could take it up to 24 point. I look at it and I can see I think that's an 8 maybe 20 point you can take it up while we're going um, I know he can do it he's really skilled and that's why he's back there on the on the computer does that make you feel better Andreas <laughs> <laughs> don't worry about it he'll get it let's look anyhow he's writing to this mature church and he tells them that Christ has given them some gifts just as Christ has given lighthouse gifts you mean Christ has given some gifts to us beyond the gifts of salvation? Yes. Beyond the gifts that we practice with each other? Yes. Paul writes and he says, these are the gifts that Christ gave to the church. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, missionaries, and pastors and teachers. So these are gifts that God has given to the church. All right. Yay. Can you see it now without your glasses? All right. Thank you so much. Okay. So take a look at this and I'll back up so that you can see it. It's from Ephesians 4, 11 through 15. And look with me. So here are the gifts that are given. So it's the office or the function or the, the, the person who will do this, who will fulfill this function within the church. Now, you may not love us very much, but guess what? Pastor Jennifer and Pastor Renee, we are your gifts. <laughs> How about that? We are gifts to the church. The, the, the 
how we function and what we do. We're gifts to the church. Do we do it perfectly? No, we don't because we're still growing as well. Um, there are those with the gifts of uh, who are missionaries or evangelists. Can you think of somebody who's been part of Lighthouse, who's functioned as an evangelist, who really has an evangelist heart? Ah, uh, there you go. Rowena, no question about it. All she had to do was look at an unsafe person and she got excited. <laughs> she wanted to tell them about Jesus. Had, have we known people who speak in the church prophetically? The, not necessarily tongues and interpretation, but prophetic has to do with inspired preaching. Did you know? Inspired teaching. That's actually the original, that's what it means in the New Testament. I can think of some, and I don't want to put them on the spot or whatever, but I, I can think, I believe that in the past, Sister Adela, we've seen part of that in her life. Certainly in the life of Dad when he was here in the beginning with the church, right? Very much. Um, apostles, what's an apostle? Apostle is somebody who goes into a new area where the Word of God has not yet been. And they proclaim, and they proclaim, and they don't, stay there a long time, they kind of keep on going. That's the New Testament meaning, not just the 12. Can you think of some that have gifts in that area? I can. I think Priscilla has some of those gifts because she goes into areas where the gospel has not been preached and she opens areas. That's why we're able to go into Sichuan in the summer English camp. Now, Does that mean that that person is, oh, you're so special? No, no, no. What this means is God loves the church so much that He loves you so much as His body that He gives gifts for a purpose, not to lift up an individual, but so that, let's look at what comes next. The next verses tell us their responsibility or purpose is to prepare God's people. Are you God's people this morning? Yes. If you are, raise your hand. So this ver now, if you're not one of God's people yet, then you still you have the future ahead of you. Make a decision soon, and then God has a purpose for you that you will fulfill when you become one of His people. But here's what it says: It's to prepare God's people, to prepare us to serve and to build up the body of Christ. And so we're serving and we're building up the body. So these gifts, these giftings that God gives, they are to help us to serve, to learn to serve, and then also to build us up. You see, being a Christian is not just about you and God. A lot of Christians think that, don't they? It's just me, Lord, bless my life. I want my life to be better. I want to whatever. God, it's just you and me. And God sees you individually, but God sees you much in a much bigger context than that. However you feel this morning, however you look at yourself and you think, I'm so weak and wimpy. I'm so, I've failed so much. I've fallen so short. God nevertheless says, I want you to grow up in me and I have service for you to do and I want you to be built up in the body because there's work that I have for you to do. That's how God looks at you and that's how God looks at me this morning. And so you see, we come to the church and sometimes maybe you think, well, the important people are Pastor Jennifer, Pastor Renee, Brother Chris, uh, Brother Stephen, Sister Panina, because you know they're the ones that really do the spiritual work. And then some of those that teach, that teach the, the Bible studies. God looks very, very differently at how we work together. And what God says is, there are, you have to be prepared to serve, and, you're, and as you serve, you're also built up. And this has to do with growing. So this is what Paul says to the most mature church. And that includes us this morning as well. He says, this is to continue, so this work continues until all of us are united in our faith and in our knowledge about God's Son until we become mature. So let me ask you something. Is the work of the pastor finished yet? And teachers, is it finished yet? No. Why? Because we're still not completely united in faith and knowledge and we're not fully mature, right? So it's an ongoing work until we measure up to Pastor Renee's expectations. Is that what it says? What does it say? We measure up to Christ. We measure up to Christ. Isn't that the great thing? You say, oh, but Christ's... No. Here's the great thing about Christ. No condemnation. 
No, you're so bad. Christ died for you that you might live for Him. That's what Christ did, and that He might live in you. And we look at people, and sometimes we get discouraged because we think, I'm not like that. I'll never be like that. You don't have to be like another person. Christ says, be like me. Be like me. And the measure is Christ, which is great because Christ never condemns. He brings us along in Him. And which is also great because we never get too proud, right? Because we've got a long way to go to measure up to Christ, haven't we? A long way. All of us do. And you see, that puts us all on the same playing field. You think I measure up to the measure of Christ yet in my own life? Oh, brothers and sisters, you don't know some of the struggles I have. I don't, you don't see it when I stand in a pulpit on Sunday morning. I still struggle with things. I still pray about things in my own life as even as I pray for you. So we keep on growing. And then he says, we are not meant to remain as children. Let me ask you something this morning. How many of you think back over your life and you would say, within this past year, you have become a Christian, not joined a church, but you have come to the place where you realize, oh, I am now not just following a church, not just part of a church, but I have given my life to Christ and I am now walking in His ways and I have His new life in me. That's what it means to be a Christian, not denomination. How many of you would say that within this past year? Do we have any? R raise your hand if you would say yes to that. Okay. Okay, so we have a few people. So, guess what? Your babies. Your babies. Is that a bad thing? No! We all had to start somewhere. We were all babies at some point. And that's great. And that's fine. We're babies. But a year from now, or two years from now, or three years from now, if you're still the same, then there's a problem, right? Then there's a problem. And so Paul says we're not meant to remain as children, but we are meant to do what? Say it with me. Hold firmly to the truth in love and to grow up in every way into Christ the head. We grow up, we become mature, we measure up to Christ who is our measure, who is our standard. Brothers and sisters, among the many things taught by the Holy Spirit in the New Testament, this message, this message is one of the central messages. It's one of the central messages. If you have any questions about that, you go back. You read the New Testament and see what Peter and Paul and James and John and Jude and all of these others, what they're talking about. This is the one of the central messages of the New Testament. So I have a responsibility and you have a responsibility. This, this passage is one of the primary reasons I'm teaching this series now about growing up. And we're looking at very practically why we want, how we grow up and why we grow up in God. It's my responsibility as your pastor to help you in this. And if I don't, I failed you as a pastor. You may like me, you may think I'm friendly, you may whatever, but if I fail you in this area, I have failed one of my primary callings and responsibilities as your pastor, as your pastor. And so it's my responsibility. Your responsibility is to receive what is preached, pray about it, weigh it, and look at it. God, is this what your word says? Is this the balance of the word? And then as the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart, your responsibility is then to mix obedience with the word of God that you have received in your life and respond to truth and grow up in Him. Amen? And as we do, we will be in unity, we will be filled with love, and we will do the work that God has called us to do, and we'll be the people that God has called us to be. Amen. Amen. We have this new spiritual DNA. If you're a child of God this morning, you've got some new DNA in you. It's different from your old DNA. And that new DNA has in you the potential to be everything that Satan destroyed in you, but God has planned for you. With that new DNA, as you grow up, you grab 
the promises of God. You grab the promises of God and you grow up and then you prove the promises of God. You don't have to claim the promises of God and ask for the promises of God and hope for the promises of God. The promises of God will be proven true in your life as you grow up in Him. God will prove Himself true in you. You don't have to hope for it. You don't have to wish for it. You don't have to say, oh God, please, 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 please. You can come before God boldly, boldly to His throne of grace and say, God, I'm here, your child, and God will make His promises, will fulfill His promises in your life and my life. Oh, brothers and sisters, there's so much more ahead. There's so much more ahead. Don't stay where you are. Don't be satisfied with who and what you are now. Don't be content with your present service and ministry in the Lord. God has more. God has more. You know, I look back at the Old Testament and some of the most wonderful stories of the Old Testament are the stories of victories in people who were old in the Lord. Really. Look at Joshua as he came into the promised land. We think of Joshua as a young man. How old was Joshua when he went into the promised land? How old, Miss Christine? 80. 80. Joshua was 80. Sister Lisa, you still got years ahead of you. You're only 75. <laughs> She's a young thing. She's a young thing. Caleb, when he said, I am well able to take the mountain where the giants are. How old was he? About 80 also. 80 and, and, and around, around that age as well, yeah. And others as well. They were on up, but there were still things ahead. There were still things ahead, amen? There's more for us. There's more for us in the Lord. I tell you right now, there are things that I know will not be open to me because of my age at this point, but there are other things that I'm so excited about. I'm looking ahead. I know I'm going to grow into. I'm preparing for now. God has more for me ahead here at Lighthouse. And I have every expectation that as I obey and walk with Him and grow, I will grow into that as you grow into the things of God. Amen? Amen. 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 So the next slide, we grow as we choose to grow. We grow as we choose to grow. So spiritual growth requires what? The nutrients of... And we've talked about this, the Word. And this is, this is where we will camp today. And then after today, we'll move on from there. It has the requirements of the Word. This is one of the nutrients. We know the other one is prayer. And we'll come to that uh, the next time we come back to this. So here we have, we take in the living and powerful Word of God. Pure spiritual milk is what Peter says. Now, I want to talk about three things today that have to do with this. And I want to say, how does the Word of God help in what way does the Word of God help produce growth in our lives? What can, we, what can we do to make sure that the Word of God is helping us to grow? In what way? And the first thing I want to talk about is consistency with the Word of God in our lives. So as we take in the Word of God consistently, that is when we will grow. That's number one. And what that means, and let me, let me just speak really frankly with you and really openly and honestly with you this morning. If you are not a person who goes to God's Word very often, maybe you go when you feel like it. Maybe you go when you're hungry for the Word of God. Maybe you go to the Word of God when you say, Oh God, I need a verse. And you do what you should never do, almost never, and you take the Bible and what do you do? <laughs> That's right. Now God in His mercy will sometimes answer that and speak to us. But you know what? That's usually for baby Christians. <laughs> but when once we start learning, and He still does that. God did that for me when I've been a Christian for many, many years. That was the mercy and the grace of God. And He prompted my heart to do that. But don't count on that, okay? Don't count on that. Instead, let me tell you how we should be going to the Word of God. Honestly, you should be going every day. And I'm not trying to condemn you this morning, but let me tell you in my own life what I have found to be true. I have found that when I take in the Word of God on a consistent basis, whether I feel spiritual or not, 
whether I'm hungry for the Word of God or not, whether I need the Word of God or not, but I'm just taking in the Word of God. Do you know what happens? Doing that creates place and space in my life for the Holy Spirit at the moment of need to then, we know it, don't we, whisper, Jennifer, it's this. And then when that happens, that's when, oh, my heart enlarges, my mind enlarges, and I understand this is the word. God, you're speaking to me. God, this is your truth for me. It's for my situation. And I will tell you that God will do that more and more in your life if you will be consistent in going to His Word. I promise you. There will be times when you go to His Word and you won't feel anything alive in it. I'm sorry, that's just the way it is. And you'll just read because that's what you should be doing. You should be doing that. Let me ask you this. How many of you do you, how many of you eat even when you're not hungry? Meal time. It's time to eat. Thank you, Steve. Steve raised his hand. I do too. I look at the, I look at the clock and I think it's time to eat. Even if, my hung, even if my stomach hasn't said anything. There's a physical parallel to a spiritual here. We eat because it's the healthy thing to do. It keeps our body strong. Now God talks about this in the Old Testament. And there's a great lesson for us about consistency in the Word. The children of Israel, they're walking through the wilderness. They're being led of God. They're going to this land of promise, but God's working in them and He's working in them and He wants them to learn and He wants them to change and He wants them to grow because they're not ready for the land of promise. They're a mess. They are all, they're worldly. They don't have any faith. They're, they're more like the Canaanites than they are like God's people. They're worshiping idols and things like that. They don't, They've heard God go to the promised land, but you know what? They don't really trust God. They, re they don't really, do they? They're, they're, they're depending on themselves. So what does God do for His people? In the middle of the wilderness, they're hungry. Million people. They don't have food. What does God do? What does He give them? He gives them manna. He gives them manna. Is manna exciting the first time He gives it to them? To them? <gasps> yes! Food appears miraculously. Do you think manna was exciting the second time, the second morning when they went out? Yes! It's, it's there again. Wow! God! Third time? Yes! Fourth time? Yes! After a month? Maybe not quite as exciting. <coughs> But they needed the manna, didn't they? They needed food every day. And so God gave them food every day because they needed it. And then do you know what He said to them through the words of Moses? He said, I let you be hungry and I fed you with manna so that you would know that man does not live by bread alone but by what? Every word of the Lord. Now here's this Old Testament symbolism that helps us with New Testament truth. We need the Word of God. And there is fresh manna every day in the Word of God. Brothers and sisters, it may not always be exciting, and it's not. It's not. It's not always exciting. But you and I need the fresh Word of God every day. And if we'll take the Word in consistently, regularly, God will grow us in Him. Amen? Amen. 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 How else should we be taking in the Word of God? So we take it in consistently. And the second one is we take the Word in through preaching and teaching. And we've talked about some of this already before, but we just as a reminder this morning, we take in the Word through preaching and teaching. So we see here... This has to do consistently, primarily with you and the Lord and the Word of God as you day by day go into the Word. 
This usually has to do with others, with Pastor Renee, with Pastor Jennifer, with the others who teach you and lead you. So through preaching and teaching. And you take in the word through preaching and teaching. And this is an opportunity and you say, because this, is, because this is one of the ways, one of the primary ways God has chosen for his people to be built up and to grow. As I've said before, not because we are so great or so special, but because you are special and God loves you and he wants you to grow. So we take it in through preaching and teaching. It comes through pastors. It comes through small group leaders. It may come through really good books about God, expounding the Word of God that you read sometimes. It may come from something you, read, you look at on the internet. How many of you sometimes go to the internet or television for preaching and teaching? Raise your hand. Okay, I do too. But if you go to other sources like that, you need to be really careful. You need to be really careful because you need to know something about that pastor's life. You need to know something about that preacher's life. How does he live when he's not in the pulpit? And it's important. It's important. You can receive and I receive from that as well, but you need to be careful about that. I will tell you this. Your primary feeding from the Word of God should come from your local church and, your, and the pastors that are over you and the leaders that are over you and the teachers that are over you. Primarily, primarily. And I want to say something to you this morning and I don't want anybody to leave Lighthouse. I really don't. But if you are in this church and you really feel, I am not being fed here. I'm not receiving the balanced word of God. The pastors are not invested in my life. If you feel that, then you need to be in a church where you do feel that. Every one of us should be connected with and plugged into a place, to a church where we belong, where people know us, where people know our lives. They know what we're going through. They may not know all the little details, but they know what we go through. They know what we struggle with, and they're committed to us in love and in care, and they will pray for us, and they will encourage us when we get discouraged, and sometimes they'll kick us a little bit if we need some kicking in love, and at other times they'll come alongside us and wipe our tears and cry with us because of what we're crying about, but it's a place where we are part of a family, and where we receive from the Word of God. That's the type of church you need to be in. And if you feel that Lighthouse is not that type of church for you, you need to be in a church that is. Come, to, uh, come talk to us. If you feel there's something, I, I feel like I'm not being whatever, then Pastor Renee and I, we, we are happy to sit down with you and talk because we're not perfect. We don't always do things right, but we're trying to but we're trying to. And you and I, we need to be in churches. We need to be part of groups. If you're part of a small group and you feel like, I'm not really receiving from that, it's not a good for, fit for me, find another small group where you do fit, where you can share openly, where people can speak God's Word into your life, because that is where we will be cared for, protected, that's where we'll grow. And that's what the family of God should look like. Amen? Amen. 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 But if you're going to leave, come talk to us before you leave. <laughs> and if we need to change, we'll change. Amen? I, we're laughing when we say that, but we really do mean it. We really do mean it. Um, I, let me put it this way. I will, we, I will accept your imperfections if you'll accept my imperfections. How about that? Is, is that a good way? To, that, that makes it easier, right? Okay. Amen. But let's not stop there. Where else do we... Where else do we grow with the Word of God? And this one is really important, and it doesn't have so much to do with pastors and leaders. And one of the most important things I want to say also is we grow in fellowship with other believers. We grow in fellowship with other believers, and I really want to encourage you in this. When we, when we are not part, in some way, of a group of Christians, and we know that in Lighthouse, not everybody is part of a small group, but I will say this to you. You do need to be connected with Christians in some way so that they can speak into your life and encourage you and so that you can speak into their lives and encourage them. Christianity, 
the Christian life, listen, it is not a one-way street. It is not, I receive, I receive, I receive, I receive. That's the life of a baby Christian, isn't it? The baby only, how many of you, you love your little babies, don't you? But those of you that have little babies, who is it about? Me, 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 right? Babies, it's all about me. It's all about me. And that's what a baby is like. That's how, that's how life begins. But a baby is to grow up. So Christianity, Christian living, it's not a one-way street. It's not all about I receive, I receive, I receive. But you must receive. It's also not all about I give, I give, I give. I have all spiritual knowledge. Pastor Renee and Pastor Jennifer, we know everything and we will speak into your lives. If we and leaders and teachers are not in the place of understanding, I've got to receive as well. We will be arrogant, proud, and hard, and very soon we will hurt the people that we minister to. Christian living is a two-way street and we are to give and to, we are to receive. And that must be done within fe in fellowship with others in fellowship with others. You need to be, if you are in a Christian family, I encourage you, share with one another. Encourage one another. Spur one another on. Do you have a group of Christian friends? Encourage one another. Husbands, are you married to a Christian wife? Encourage her. Spur her on in spiritual matters. Wives, married to a Christian husband? Encourage him. Help him to be the man of God that God has called him to be. We are to encourage one another, and that is done in fellowship with other believers. Look at Colossians 3.16. Here's this great, oh, this is one of my favorite verses. And I love this one because you know what? This is not a command primarily to pastors. Do you see this? Look at Colossians 3.16. Paul says to the Colossian church, not to the pastors of the church, not to the leaders or the elders, but to all of them. He says, let the message about Christ in all its richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he got, gives. Do you see that? That's done as we're together, isn't it? That's done as we're around each other. And there should be a place for that. There should be a place for that. And I want to challenge you and encourage you. And I love this. Let the message about Christ in all its richness fill your lives. Have you ever been around a Christian? They only have one message. They only say one thing. It's sort of the same thing over and over and over and over again. I, I, don't, I have, but I've been a Christian a lot longer than most of you have, and I've been in a lot of other circumstances. I'm not talking about Lighthouse. How about if I put it that way? In other places. There's some people, it's just this, 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 and this. Paul says, Phew, all its richness. Let the message of Christ. There's so much about Christ. You see, I, when I come in and when you're with your brothers and sisters or whatever, they don't always need to hear, God bless you, hope you're doing okay. That's not always the message that's known. God loves you. Sometimes they need to hear, be strong in the Lord. Don't be afraid. I'll stand with you. I'm praying with you. Have faith. God is going to answer. All of this is the Word of God. And as God's Word dwells in you richly, you will have the right Word at the right time for the right person. And that happens in fellowship. There's one other one, 2 Corinthians 13, that church that wasn't so very spiritual. But Paul still says to them, because they were growing, he says, I'm closing my letter with these last words, Be joyful! Grow to maturity. They still need to grow, right? And then he said, encourage each other. Encourage each other. Let me tell you something. When you come to Lighthouse on Sunday mornings, may I challenge you to do something? May I challenge you on Sunday mornings, when you get up on Sunday mornings, talk to the Lord and say, God, help me to encourage someone today. God, give me Give me a word to share. Lord, help me to be sensitive to your spirit. God, speak through me today. Lord, use me today. May I tell you something? That's 2 Corinthians 13, verse 11, the first part of verse 11. May I tell you something? Pastor Renee and I, on an individual basis, can touch very few of you on a Sunday morning. Very few of you. We're only two people. But do you know what? You're sitting next to somebody maybe that you know very well. 
or that you're around people. You know what they're going through. And the Holy Spirit will use you to encourage that person that you know, that's near you. You can speak a word into their lives that will touch them at their point of need and they will feel God's love and they will be strengthened. And that's something that Pastor Renee and I cannot do much of the time. We cannot do. You can. And God wants to do it through you. It is God's plan to do it through you, not through the pastors. Not through the pastors. Amen? Amen. It's true. It's true. Amen. So in the context of fellowship with other believers. Okay, let's go on a little bit further. And so we see here, um, as we move on, spiritual growth thrives. Now, notice that I don't say it has to be this way, but I chose this word carefully. Spiritual growth thrives. What does the word thrive mean? Give me some other give me some synonyms for that. Or how would you express it in another way? To thrive. Doing well. Flourish. That's a great word, okay? Flourish. It means to really, really grow. It thrives. It doesn't just survive. Spiritual growth thrives in what type of environment? In the environment of, as we've just said, fellowship. It thrives in the environment of fellowship. I want to encourage you in this a little bit more. I spent longer in the first service than I'm going to in this service, but I want to encourage without condemning this morning. There are some at Lighthouse, or there are some in church, this is true for every church, that if you are not here on Sunday morning, the pastors know their employer has made them work, number one, or number two, they are deathly ill and they cannot get out of bed this morning. I know that. I, if somebody, if, if someone is not there, I know, I don't, I'm not going to call any names, okay? Um, but if I, I know if they're not here, if I look around and I don't see their face, maybe they're, or the, maybe they're, they're, they're traveling for, for whatever reason, they're away, they're outside of Hong Kong. And I know if they're not here, that's why. And then I'll be really honest with you, without condemning. There are others that if they're not here, I'll honestly say, the pastors don't necessarily assume they have to work or that they're sick. Because in every church, there are floaters. They float in and they float out. Do they count this as their church? In every church, they may count that church. Is it their church home? Yes, it's their church home. Do they tithe there? Yes, they tithe there. But is there a strong, rooted connection and urgency I am going to be with my brothers and sisters in church today, if at all possible. There's not. And I'll be really honest with you, without condemning, and I really mean it. Please listen from, from a heart of love, from a heart of love. When we have concern for people, honestly speaking, as pastors, we are the most concerned about those that float a little bit more those that float a little bit more. May I tell you why, without condemning? It's because when we float in fellowship, when we float in fellowship, what it says about us is fellowship is not absolutely necessary. I can take it or leave it. I'll be all right if I don't have fellowship. I'll be there some. I've got some other things to do. I'm going to relax this, this Sunday. I was out late Saturday. I was doing a lot. I'm just kind of tired. I'll stay home. Well, I need to catch up on work. There's a lot of work to do. Not when the boss says, you've got to be here. You can't. You have to be here. I don't mean that. And I'm not trying to condemn. I want to encourage you this morning. But I am concerned. And Pastor Renee is concerned. I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I know he is. We are concerned for floaters because I will tell you something from experience, from a time in my own life in graduate school when I was floating a little bit myself. The enemy will always attack floaters first. Always. 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 I encourage you, get plugged in and stay plugged in. Amen? Amen. Please take that as it was intended with love.
because we care for you. Amen? Amen. The writer to Hebrews says, Oh, wow. I prayed this morning, Lord, help me to get through as far as I need to get through. I did in the first service. I, I will end with this this morning. The writer to Hebrews, and we don't know who he, he or she was, but he said to very mature believers, he said this, look with me as we close with this, let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Let us not neglect. And neglect doesn't mean I hate going to church. Neglect doesn't mean I'm not going to go to church today. Neglect means it's not so important whether I'm there or whether I'm not. Is church always the most exciting thing in the world? Not always. But there is a strength and a covering and an encouragement that you receive and that you give. And listen carefully. If you're a child of God, God has a gift in you that He has put for the benefit of other Christians. He really has. And if you're not there, somebody's going to miss out. Somebody's going, somebody's going to miss out. And you say, oh, Pastor Jennifer, you're stretching. I'm not. This is, this is what the Word of God shows us and teaches us. And when children of God are not part, they miss receiving and they miss giving. And others will miss what God wanted to do through you to speak to that person. Brothers and sisters, do not neglect the gathering together the gathering together with other brothers and sisters. If work keeps you away, work keeps you away. But say, God, if at all possible, I'm going to be with my brothers and sisters. I'm not going to neglect because I want to do what you've called me to do. I want to be what you've called me to be. Lord, I don't want some brother or sister to stumble this Sunday because I'm not there but I want to be there if you want to speak through me and sometimes listen you may not even speak a word but your presence and your face and your worship and your friendship will strengthen someone else amen amen and that is part of being in the family of God let's close in prayer let's close in prayer Holly